I think we're the first open air airport swimming pool. <laughs> Hang on there. You got a yes. swimming pool? <laughs> yes, we have an open air swimming pool at Terminal 1, uh, next to the uh, Terminal 1 hotel. It, it even becomes like a party scene and there's even a queue sometimes. <laughs> You're listening to CX Passport, the show about creating great customer experiences with a dash of travel talk. Each episode, we'll talk with our guests about great CX, travel, and just like the best journeys, explore new directions we never anticipated. I'm your host, Rick Denton. I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Let's get going. Guilty. Yeah, I'm guilty of being an airline geek from time to time. I'm the one who stares up at the sky and wants to see, you know, which airline is flying overhead and imagining the exciting destination that awaits those travelers. With a love of airlines comes a fascination with airports. There are some spectacular ones out there. There are also some stunningly atrocious ones. And, you know, it's not just luxury for me. I can be delighted with the open air Caribbean airport with the air stairs to the plane. And trust me, I love air stairs. I wave to my non-existent faux paparazzi every time I stand at the top of them. Just as much as I can be delighted with a hyper luxury, immersive airport. Because of that today, we are in for a fun ride, or should I say flight, as I get a chance to talk to Andrew Tan, Director and Head, Airport Operations Consultancy for one of the world's premier airports, Chungi Airport in Singapore. Andrew has spent around 30 years in the aviation industry with several international airlines. Desiring to share that passion with a new generation, he's done a stint teaching aviation to young, passionate future learners. Today, he helps airports around the world learn how to emulate the Chungi experience. I'll let him share more about that in the show. Do you know what Chungi was named for? I didn't either. I assumed it was a political figure or something that's kind of traditional like that. In a peaceful twist, Chungi is actually named for a tree in the area where the airport stands. While I've never been to this airport, I've heard how beautiful and efficient it is. Folks, people have their weddings at Chungi. Weddings. Think about that next time you suffer through one of your lesser airports in your travels. That's why Andrew's role exists and why there's such demand today, from advising airports in Brazil to support the Rio 2016 Olympics to supporting contactless check-in in the Philippines. Airports globally want what Chungi has. It'll be fascinating to talk with Andrew today. Andrew, welcome to CX Passport. Thanks, Rick. Let's get going here. Your your role is just unique to me. It's not one that I knew existed. And so it'd be great if you would just share a little bit about your current role today with our listeners. Okay, Rick. Um, I'm, I'm the Director and Practice Head of Operations at Changi Airports International. Uh, basically, we are the overseas arm of Changi Airport. Uh, we help operate and manage airports overseas. We invest in airports and we also consult to airport clients who, like you said, want to bring their, their customer experience or their operational efficiency or to improve their uh, retail and F&B experience at the airport for travelers. In, in a nutshell, anything outside of Singapore is under Changi Airports International and, and I'm in charge of the operations and services there. Yeah. Well, you've, you've got a nice... Um... Or well, at least canvas with which to work. If it's any airport outside of Singapore, that gives you quite a lot of opportunity there. And I've been in my fair share of airports. You have too. And you know, you know and we're not going to name them, but some airports are just hideous. Others are just basically nice. They, they work, but nothing special. And then others are spectacular. So I imagine if other airports want to be like Chang'e, there's got to be something truly special about it as an airport. I've alluded to it, but I haven't seen it. I've heard it. Tell me and tell the listeners, what is it about Chang'e's airport that is just so special to passengers? I think from the start, Chang'e always um, realized that strategically airports are important to communities, to economies, to people uh, and nations. And, and there was a strong drive by the airport, the airlines, the stakeholders towards this higher goal. Um, and it's, of course, it starts off with having efficient facilities and, and fast right. processing. And, and once you got the basic, uh, that's when you start leveling up your game to passenger experience, to passenger delight, and even surprise, right? 
Uh, mm-hmm. People go and they see something or experience something at an airport that they would never exp- expect. Whether it's a butterfly gar- garden in Terminal Two, uh, uh, sorry, Terminal Three, or a, <laughs> a sunflower garden, you know, there's there's always something different and and unique at Changi Airport. Um, and and I, well, I think credit also goes to our competitor airports. They they emulate what we have, and that just mm-hmm. inspires us to go the next step and to challenge ourselves and 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 uh, give a, a better experience to passengers. You know, passengers as consumers have a choice. So we want to make sure we're in the right position to attract passengers and airlines to Changi Airport. And I think that's something you helped me understand earlier. First, uh, let me say something, go back to something that you said that made me chuckle a little bit is, you know, once you've gotten the basic operations right, how many airports out there can you and I both say they haven't even gotten the basic operations right? So <laughs> there's a there's a threshold of airport that hasn't even achieved that. But to go to that delight stage, that's something that I, I certainly hear you you working with. And I think that was something that you helped me understand when we talked earlier that, yes, customers have a choice, but a lot of us are, are, are routed through an airport by the choice of our airline. It's the airline that's that chooses the airport. What is it about the airport experience that makes an airline want to choose it, which would then explain why an airport would want to engage someone like you to help make their airport better to attract those airlines? Yeah, you're, you're right. Actually, um, I, I think we view our customer is not just the passenger who gets on the piece of metal but right. also the, the the airline that flies that piece of metal so of course on the passenger side you have things like a smooth efficient check-in you have a lot of immigration counters security everyone's pleasant on the airline side you need to facilitate fast turnarounds efficient processes when, you know if an airline is going to start flights and, and being in, from Singapore Airlines I've started flights I started flights in Las Vegas okay and Oh, hey, there's a winner. (laughs) Singapore to Vegas. All right. (laughs) So airports that make it easier for airlines to fly, whether it's incentives, whether having uh, structured processes to make it quick for airlines to to, to start their flights, Mm -hmm. that help, you know, airlines to go there. And it's not just about, okay, if you want to, you know, just come to my airport, you're going to get passengers. Like I, I need to, we need to convince airlines that there's a strong business case. We pair them up with other airlines to have connectivity. So it's not just, you know, one, one individual airlines, the whole ecosystem working together. Yeah. It, I think that's the part that I didn't quite appreciate as a traveler is, you know, I there's a certain destination pair that I would like an airline to start. And I'm not going to mention it, not going to get into details mm-hmm. between my home and another particular city. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, as long as there's just demand there, why is the airline not doing it? And you're describing a whole set of other layers that would incent an airline and to choose a particular airport beyond just does a customer demand that point to point existence. And how does that, you know, I think about just customer experience in general. So think about it at the passenger layer for just a second, right? Passengers don't say, oh, I want to go to this airport or I want to go to that airport most of the time. But there are some experiences that an airport, the customer says, oh, no, I really love that airport. And it, to take it beyond just a through point that a traveler is traveling through, but to be something delightful, why is customer experience at the airport so vital? Well, I, I think the customer experience is the last thing you remember. If you had a nasty experience, you, <laughs> you're going to have that negative impression yeah. of an airport. So if it's something positive, it 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 sticks in your mind and mm-hmm. – and I, Changi, we, we take it one step further. If you look at the uh, backdrop, I, I know the, <laughs> the audience can't see my backdrop, but Google Jewel Changi Airport. And we've created a waterfall um, in this facility just next to Terminal 1, right? And it's an amazing sight. And if you look at my photo, you can see the SkyTrain. The SkyTrain is an automated people mover. So mm-hmm. it, it transfers passengers between terminals, both on the public side on, and on the air side this actually passes through Jewel. So if you're transferring from Terminal 2 to Terminal 3, it will go through and uh, I hope you get to experience it. It actually slows down. So it's a bit like a, a welcome to Jurassic Park. It oh slows my gosh. down, there's music and there's this wow factor. So if you only thought, okay, um, Singapore Airlines has the best connection and the best price, I'm going to transit. Next time when you transfer, you're going to see Jewel and you say, gosh, 
I'm going to actually book myself a 12-hour or 24-hour layer just so I can get out through immigration and see this beauty. So that, that's the next level that, that we, we strive for to actually create an attraction in itself. Uh, airport is not just a facilitator of travel. The airport becomes a destination. Um, and it's not just even before Jewel, right? Um, we have we have events like uh, you know during school holidays, Christmas, you name it. Um, are you a fan of Star Wars? I have enjoyed Star Wars. I yeah. remember being a little kid queuing <laughs> up for a movie long ago in the seventies. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, I can't remember. Maybe it was about six years ago. We actually had a Star Wars year-end promotion, and there was like a Y-wing, X-wing fighter in one terminal. A tie, life-size tie fighter in a terminal, and we had, oh my gosh. Um, you know, act, actors dressed up in costumes. You know, so it becomes a destination in itself that people will say, I, "I'm not traveling, but it's the weekend. Why don't I bring my kids here?" Oh my gosh, so that, that's actually elevating the customer experience, and the customer no longer is just the passenger or the airline. It's actually just it includes the public who find a reason to come to the airport. This is your captain speaking. I want to thank you for listening to CX Passport today. We've now reached our cruising altitude, so I'll turn that seatbelt sign off. While you're getting comfortable, hit that follow or subscribe button on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Love if you'd tell a friend about CX Passport, leave a review so others can discover the show as well. Now sit back and enjoy the rest of the episode. Well, and, and it, I alluded, or I didn't, I stated it there in the intro that people, I, I, that blew my mind when I was looking through the website that people have their weddings at Chungi. I just, I can't even imagine. But when anyone, and I will put a link to some photos or include the photos, uh, if you look at this this garden that Andrew is describing, it is beautiful. And to see the train actually go through it, I have almost a Disney esque kind of visualization, Jurassic Park or Disney, where it's an experience in and of itself. And you said something very early on in the episode that caught my ear. And it was that airports are important to the community as well. And I know that they are viewed as business engines. Where I live, DFW, is widely regarded as having driven the economic success or one of the major drivers of economic success for the North Texas region. You're describing another layer of community, and that is its engagement with the the people of the community and making it a delight for the, the, the people, the families inside the community through the delights that the airport offers. Uh, that that really surprises me. Yeah, so um, I'll give you another example. We we have this area in Terminal 3. We call it step. So previously, it was like a void area near the glass of the curb mm. sign. And, and usually these are areas no one hangs around. We actually created like a, a step pavilion and we put a giant TV screen. So during the World Cup, people could watch the World Cup for free. Nice. Or, and, and otherwise, we screen movies. So it, and, and we don't charge, right? It's all free. So it becomes a magnet it, it, that people, families, uh, mm -hmm. couples, students will come here in their free time. And since you're here, you might as well have a meal. You might as well go to a supermarket and buy your groceries instead of going to your neighborhood mall. So wow. it's it's a whole ecosystem in itself that, that we've created in Changi. And, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the episode. It's even becoming clearer to me beyond our earlier conversations why a role like yours is is so uh, sought after by other airports. It, when you're describing something that isn't just an economic engine inside the airline industry itself, but rather for the community as a large and what that could do for business development there – I want to pivot for a second, and that is because we are talking – I'm talking to you in Singapore. Thank you for staying up late at night. I appreciate that. Sure. And I know that uh, Singapore is an amazing destination. I've mentioned not having the chance to be there, but I hope to sometime. Help me visualize Singapore as a future traveler. What would traveling to Singapore be like? What should I see? Where should I go? What should I eat? Okay. Well, you – land in one of our four terminals. Uh, oh, good. Okay. If you're, if you're <laughs> I like how you in, start with the airport. If you're coming <laughs> in the next 10 years, um, <laughs> uh, most of your, almost every flight, I, can, I think I can safely say almost every flight would have a jet bridge. So you're an air condition comfort away. I, so you won't get your paparazzi taking photos of you yeah. down the step. Sorry. But in Singapore, I'm glad <laughs> to have the air conditioning. I, I know that part of the, the yeah. climate. Um, 
you would you would take travel letters if it's a certain long distance, go down to the uh, immigration hall. The immigration hall is tall and spacious because you know, border control can be scary and stressful, right? And uh, after clearing immigration, you would pick up your luggage. Again, a very tall, spacious hall. Terminal 3, for example, has a, a lot of greenery. You imagine you're in a park and your bag comes out. We have... We have quite stringent targets. Um, I, I, I think I can honestly say it probably comes out faster than a lot of other airports. Eh? Okay. Um, pick up your bags and a short distance later, if you're taking a taxi, there's a nice orderly queue. You don't have to worry worry about the being con because we publish guidelines on taxi fares. Love it's it. All meet, it's metered taxis. There's no, yeah. you must use my airport taxi and pay 50% more, right? It's all there. Uh, right. we, we actually view it more as a service than a commercial thing. We don't, you know, like get money and and from that. Yeah. Right. Uh, oh, if you another, want to take a, yeah. I mean, another like even I'm, I want to hear more about the city. I'm interrupting you. I apologize yeah. for that. It's just even you're describing the immigration hall, designing it to be beautiful, to be attractive to the traveler, the, all the way down to the taxis of making sure that the customer, the passenger, the person experiencing this doesn't have uh, – you reduce as much stress as possible in this, that it's not necessarily a commercial enterprise for the airport, but rather it is a delivery of experience for the customer, the passenger, to make their memory of Chungi something special. Now I'm in the taxi and I'm heading you to, to the city. Tell me about – I'm a tourist. I can't wait. So you would go down uh, a wide avenue, white by Singapore standards, which <laughs> is a small island. But it's nice and clear because a long time ago, we, we decided the airport has to be a showcase and you, you don't want to go through some narrow roads and that changes your impression of Singapore, right? So you take the main expressway, you'll be in town and uh, as you head towards the uh, viaduct, you'll see things like the Singapore Flyer, which is a a giant Ferris wheel. You'll yeah. see Gardens by the Bay, which is two glass domes uh, of air-conditioned um, greeneries. So, you, so if you're from the tropics, you would see greenery from temperate countries. Um, so, depending on whether where, where you're staying, you could stay at one of our integrated resorts if you're a gambler. Right. Uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't, yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm very uh, well aware of it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, De Sentosa Island, which has a Universal Studios. So I, I think it also depends on what the traveler wants. If you like culture and history, I, I tell a lot of my, my friends from far away that if you have only a few days and you want to experience Asia, Singapore is the place to be because ethnically we got Chinese origin people, we have Malay origin, we have Indian origin, and, and a lot of other mixes. So it's a good exposure to Asia because we are a bit in between the West and a bit in on in on the East. I like that. You're, you're, yeah. you're, to use a, a an oft-used phrase for America, uh, it sounds like you're the melting pot of Asia there in, in Singapore, of, of coming together and being able to experience all of those cultures. I, before we, we move on, I want to I, – I love some of the sights and the visualization. I'm an eater. I love eating. Tell me about if I if I am there for three days, what do I want to eat? What do you want to make sure that I don't leave the city without enjoying from a meal perspective? Okay, this is, is probably a contentious issue because everyone Ooh. has their own favorites. Of course. Um, as, as my guest, I will ask you, how's your tolerance for spicy food? Because I think over here, being a melting pot, we've got a lot of uh, different right. spice influence, right? Um, I think I would bring you to Little India, which is okay. the Indian version of Chinatown. <laughs> okay, Here, right. We don't call it Chinatown, we call it town. No, just kidding. We do have a Chinatown. <laughs> um, well done, sir. I see yeah. that dad jokes are universal. <laughs> I yes. like that. <laughs> yes. Um, and at Little India, uh, we I would take you to eat banana leaf. Now, what is banana leaf? It's... Uh, it's from India. It's from the Tamil Nadu region, which is southeast of India. And uh, there's a banana leaf on the table and they scoop rice and curries and pickles and vegetables. And traditionally, you eat it with a hand. So it, it's, wow, you can taste lots of flavors on one leaf. <laughs> so, I like it. So that's banana leaf, uh, if you like kind of spicy food. Um, other ethnic food is, uh, let's say, the Malay food. So there's this thing called nasi lemak, which literally translated means fatty rice. It's rice that's been cooked in in 
uh, coconut. Is it coconut oil? I'm not a cook. Coconut milk. Okay. Uh, and and season with with other leaves. I, again, I'm not a cook. Uh, fried anchovies and peanuts and a, and a spicy uh, kind of paste. Holy yeah, cow, that sounds really good. Yeah. And uh, for Chinese food, there's depends on whether you want to try food from the north of China or south of China. Traditionally, I think most of the people from Singapore are from the south. So mm-hmm. uh, I would describe it as maybe a lighter taste. Uh, but as you go north, it becomes more spicy like hot pot soup. <sighs> the world's your oyster here, Rick. Andrew, a little change of pace here, although my stomach is still kind of rumbling thinking about all the good food that uh, I I clearly need to get on a flight and go to Singapore. But one of the things about that flight to Singapore, um, typically anywhere from the the Western Hemisphere, that's a long flight and travel can be somewhat wearing. So the lounge can be a nice little respite in our travels. And so I'd like for you to take a respite here. Join me in the first class lounge. Let's have a little fun here. What is a dream travel location from your past? Uh, when you say past, is it like my past life, like Cleopatra? And uh, no, I've never had a guest <laughs> ask that, but you can you can own the answer any way you want to own it. Dream travel location. Okay, uh, I think that's a hard question because um, <laughs> I've I lost count, but I've I think I've lived in more than ten countries, wow. in cities. Um. So actually, when it comes to holiday time, I'm a sloth. I like to stay at home. Um, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, and and I think in terms of travel, my goal is just keep on going to places I've never been. Before. Okay, well, yeah. that's I I want to know where your your dream travel location of the future is. It sounds like that answer is anywhere that you've not been to yet. I like that open ended aspect of it, and that that doesn't surprise me. Someone who is housed and based at an airport that has access to the globe, you truly could go just about anywhere on a nonstop flight from there. We talked about food, Andrew. I'm curious, what is your favorite thing to eat? Everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> good question. You are a man okay. after my heart. I like it. <laughs> uh, okay. There's this, uh, I guess, I guess uh, top of my mind is this, it's a local dish called laksa. Okay. So, it's it's a, a it's noodles cooked in a in a curry coconut curry broth, right? Oh wow! Okay. Now specifically, I like it with a type of cockle which locally we call sea ham. It's a, it's a type of cockle and like it's a blood cockle, so I like it rare. Yeah. Okay. Oh gosh, this sounds really, really good. I love, especially part of the reason this podcast is global is so I get to hear perspectives around the globe. Mm-hmm. And I love hearing the food stories around the globe. So I'll keep an eye out for that one when I'm heading to Singapore in the future. On the other side, Andrew, what is something your parents forced you to eat but you hated as a kid? Um, Liver. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Yeah, I'm with yeah. you there. But I've yeah. uh, I've grown up. I I love pate now. So yeah. Well, uh, good good for you. I still haven't <laughs> quite gotten there. I can tolerate it, but liver is a dish. No, I'm I'm out. Yeah. I'm I'm I agree with you there. So with all of your travels, even though it sounds like your desire is to stay home, but I know that you're still traveling quite a bit. What is one travel item, not including your phone, not including your passport, you will not leave home without? Hmm. Um, I think travel adapter, which I recently learned on a trip to Europe that I forgot my travel adapter. Andrew, let's go back to talking about your role. Oh, it, I can certainly see, as we talked about at the beginning, how that role is important uh, in elevating the airport experience around the globe. I want to walk through kind of what do you do? You've shown up. It's your first step at that new airport that reached out to help you improve their overall operations. Just walk me through your thoughts. What are you looking for? How do you sense what an airport really needs? Um, yeah, I think it's it's not like it's in a manual. Um, it's I think right. it comes after years of having o- occupational disease that when you go on holiday, you start picking apart cues and whether the staff smile and say thank you. Uh, but typically, what I'll do is I'll walk the floor uh, um, from 
curbside to check in security mm-hmm. immigration to the gate and the same thing for arrivals um i i think uh, i would do it during the peak i yeah. don't like to have an entourage of the local managers guiding me which happened on one <laughs> visit where right i swear to god there were three golf buggies in a convoy and you're not going to see anything because every manager and his supervisor under him is going to make sure everything's running which is not oh, what yeah. you right you, you kind of want to be a mystery traveler and and you know like a fly on the wall or behind standing behind a pillar and observing and then you can actually see what happens yeah. um i always look i try to look through the lens of a traveler because then you have a certain perspective. If I, if I look through the lens of an airport operator or an airline guy, I'll probably say, yeah, but that happens because, and you, and you create excuses. So I have to switch mindsets into I'm a passenger. I, I deserve a certain experience and, and look at it that way. You have in that sentence it almost encapsulated one of the key principles that it, it, of customer experience and it, it it's why you and i were brought together how we came to know each other is that spirit of I, i'm not going to be able to design a airport experience a passenger experience a customer experience in the boardroom in a conference room i gotta get out there and not only do i have to get out there i can't do it through the lens of me the operations leader who knows all and this is why the process works that way but rather through the lens of the customer and that's so true in so many other areas and it's a failure point for a lot of businesses i talk a lot about that both on this show and with clients is of don't try to design that with the your corporate lens or in your conference room lens but rather get out there listen to the customer observe the customer live with the customer be the customer and it sounds like you as a traveler have a leg up there that you can absolutely be that traveler you know one of the things that i imagine that you do see when you're there is the technology and that's a key part of airport operations right? it, it, those of us that have been traveling for decades now Heck, I still remember paper tickets, like actually going in the red carbon on the back of it and all of that. So technology clearly has evolved. Now, a lot are in love with it as the way to solve and improve customer experience. And that's true. I know that you've also seen how that doesn't work completely. Technology is not the complete solution. How should we contextualize technology in the context overall to ensure a great customer experience? I think, um, firstly, it starts off with who is the user. And when I say user, it could be the passenger who has to use a kiosk to check in. Yeah. Um, it could be the airline who has to top up the stock of boarding pass paper. It could be the, the IT technician who has to maintain the system. So yeah. you, you have to look at, at these users. Now, um, in I think in Singapore, we're lucky because... Uh, uh, a lot of us are digital natives. Well, at least my kids are. Not, <laughs> hey, you um, and I have a very similar view yeah. there. My kids are. But when you have when you have digital natives, they're they're not worried about pressing a screen, right? Um, right. But as as you get to the elderly, they're they're not going to be so confident. Uh, so right. look at the passenger. I, I, example today, I just happened to walk through, walk, walk by a self-service kiosk, and I saw a, a man struggling, and it, it was just a simple case that he didn't press the logo of the airline. Uh-huh. So maybe there needs to be some video that says, "Please press here" or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Which um which we've actually done in some of our screensavers. So um if if you walk pass a kiosk when when it's like in hibernating mode there's a little butterfly the idea is that kids will see the butterfly and they'll oh i want to press right uh so look at the customer now if we appreciate that there's going to be digital naives who are going to have trouble using the uh, self-service then how do you facilitate do you have staff there to help uh, or do you set up a, a counter at the side to help such Passengers who, or, or, or you know, passengers who maybe have a who are differenti- differentially differentially able, right? Right. Yeah. So I think we have to look at these things. Uh, another case study is, um, an airport may want to to BIOS technology and say, okay, I'm going to speed up the process. It looks sexy, you know. Mm-hmm. But if the process requires physical checks, example, COVID tests. 
COVID vaccination and your systems and your machines are not geared up to check that, then your machines are just going to gather dust because passengers yeah. will still go to a counter. And why do I want to cure the machine if I have to go to the counter anyway? Yeah. So I think all, all these have to be reviewed. Uh, and as an airport, when you put in such facilities, do you get buy-in from the airlines? The airline may say, no way I'm going to allow you to put my system there or how much you're going to uh, charge yeah. me. So all this has to be looked into in totality. Um, it's never easy, but I, I think as, as, as we step up, of course, the adoption is going to be higher and higher. Yeah. And you led with something there. It, actually, you closed with the idea that you've got a lot of stakeholders. You've got the airlines right, that are involved. That you can't just do technology because if your airlines aren't interested in it or don't want to pay for it, then you can't do that. You started with another stakeholder, and that was someone who was touching at a screen that you could tell just they, they hadn't done the, the logo correctly. And it's about understanding the why of that and getting in there and understanding what that customer is experiencing, not only what they said, but what they're doing. And then learning from that and improving on that, it, it, that bringing technology and humanity together requires understanding that customer who's standing there tapping at the screen or maybe not tapping at the screen, frustrated that they're not able to accomplish what they want to accomplish. Um, we are close to the end of time here, Andrew, and I want to close out with a little bit of fun. You've told me some of the things that are absolutely delightful, and I continue to look over your shoulder there, the, the beauty that is the Chungi Airport. Uh, I know that there are some long layovers that come through there, and I know passengers are going to be finding delights. Beyond the ones that you mentioned, are there some hidden delights, some treasures in the airport that may not be as widely known that are incredibly delightful? That's that's a very interesting point. As, as a as a local in Singapore, I've always zoomed through the airport, right? Uh -huh. I, especially if you work for an airline, you think you know the system and you go show up at the last minute because right. you think that oh minus six minutes I can step on the plane. But anyway, yeah. I digress. <laughs> Been there. Um, yeah. So I think once I started working for the airport and and then I've I've seen a lot of hidden things that a, a local passenger, but someone with twelve hours would spot. We have koi gardens. Um, so Terminal 1 has a cactus garden. Terminal oh. 1 also has the, I think we're the first open air airport swimming pool. <laughs> Hang on there. You got a yes. swimming pool? <laughs> yes, we have an open air swimming pool at Terminal 1 uh, next to the uh, Terminal 1 hotel. It, it even becomes like a party scene and there's even a queue sometimes because a lot of the uh, people from cold countries, that's their last spot of sunshine, you know, and they want to gain some sun and... and no cold, way! That's whatever. awesome! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's Terminal 1 as an example. Terminal 2, we have a butterfly... Uh, no, sorry, Cactus Garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and actually, Terminal 2 is a bit different because it's more regional flight, so you don't have that many long layovers. So okay. I, I, I think the, the Butterfly Garden, and we used to have a... a a gaming center, yeah. Oh my gosh, Terminal this is awesome. Terminal, Terminal 3 has a, a butterfly garden, koi ponds. Um, and, you know, you mentioned about first class lounge. I, I, and I, I remember Terminal 3, actually, if you walk in some of the waiting areas, the seats, it is like being in a first class lounge and it's free. Nice. Nice. Oh man. Well, let's, let's end there. First of all, I just want to end with visualizing this. I, I, I'm still stuck on the swimming pool. Everything else is beautiful as well. But the fact that there's an open air swimming pool that becomes a party scene, that that cracks me up. So, folks, if you're listening, just book your flight to Singapore to the airport and just go hang out at a and party at the pool. But clearly, no, the city of Singapore is something that folks would want to get to see. Andrew, how can folks get in touch with you to learn more? If they if, if they have an airport operations that they're responsible for, they want to talk to you about that, or they just want to talk to you about passenger aviation and 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 customer experience. Sure. Um, our website is www.cai.sg. Um, or you can uh, look me up on LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah. I'll get I'll get both of those into the show notes, folks. Scroll down as usual, click the links, and you'll get in touch with Andrew. Andrew, what a fun conversation today! I really enjoyed getting to at least live virtually in Singapore for a moment. Uh, both the city, and I cannot wait to experience some of the the, the travel elements that you describe, the food elements you describe, and then the airport itself. What an absolute delight the airport must be! And thank you for sharing and, and opening my eyes and helping me learn about this this entire consulting arm of helping other airports around the world 
achieve some of the level of greatness that Chungi has. And I hope to see more and more airports around the world match what you've got. Andrew, it was wonderful talking with you today. Thank you for being on CX Passport. Thank you, Rick. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. You've been a wonderful host. Thank you. And hope to see you in Singapore and Changi Jewel. Thanks for joining us this week on CX Passport. Make sure to visit our website, cxpassport.com, where you can hit subscribe so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, you can check out the rest of the ex for cx website. If you're looking to get real about customer experience, ex for cx is available to help you increase revenue by starting to listen to your customers and create great experiences for every customer, every time. Thanks for listening to CX Passport and be sure to tune in for our next episode. Until next time, I'm Rick Denton, and I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Mm-hmm.